I am Ellen Andrews, I'm from the Connecticut Health Policy Project, but I was also had the dubious honor of co-chairing the Sustinet, both task forces on workforce and patient-centered medical homes. So I feel very strongly about collaboratives. Nobody does anything alone. It's really, really important for us all. No, you don't have to start this from scratch. A lot of people have done a lot of work. There's a lot of wisdom in Connecticut and in other states, as we're gonna hear. Um, so it's really important. My secret, I am gonna ask you all, so start thinking now, what's your, your best idea? What, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? My, um, if you ever are lucky enough to chair two uh, task forces, my, um, my biggest secret for you, chocolate. <laughs> Those little tiny little Hershey bars, they're wonderful. Um, I don't know if it kept their mouths full or if it was, you know, whatever, it worked. Um, I'm going to do a little quick, um, very quick, um, uh, update on what's happening in patient-centered medical homes in Connecticut. We're going to hear about from Ken about one program, but there are other things in Connecticut as well. Um, we started a little behind other states, but we're gaining ground. There are 732 now recognized by NCQA, and every month I look, there's more. Um, our two largest purchasing pools in the state, this is really important to know because people think Medicaid is the poor stepchild of Connecticut's healthcare system. It's not. It's over a half a million people, and it's going to get a lot bigger January 1st of 2014. So it is a market mover, and it should be. Um, and it's becoming that. Um, the Medicaid program started in January to increase funding for recognized pa patient center medical homes with higher payment rates higher Medicaid rates, uh, don't get excited, um, and glide path funding, recognizing that it takes money and effort to start this, to get to the place where you're recognized. They, that, that, that requires resources, it requires time and effort, and you should be reimbursed for that. So they have glide path funding. Um, there are now 786 providers from 40 practices at 215 sites around Connecticut that are either approved patient center medical homes or on the glide path, which I think is wicked cool. We have more providers in the Medicaid PCMH program at, at some level than we have in all of Connecticut who are already recognized. That's momentum and that's moving forward and I think Everyone in this audience should take credit for that. It includes FQHCs, hospital outpatient clinics, school-based health centers, and independent practices. Um, DSS is actively recruiting practices. If you have not gotten a call from them, give me your card, because you will. Um, they are recruiting practices both that currently participate in Medicaid and those who don't, but have received um, NCQA accreditation and might be interested in maybe caring for the people I represent. Um, I won't, there's a lot more information about what the barriers are. You probably already know what the barriers are. EHRs and Medicaid payments top the list of what the barriers are. But DSS is, a conf is a dealing with them, recognizes them, and is working on them. Um, and we have like eight different committees, if you want to join, um, working on all of this. It is working so well that, well, one of the things, and I know Ken's going to talk about this, but one of the really important lessons learned is the importance of provider champions, people who are going to go out and sell this to their colleagues to get them excited, build momentum, and that's how we're going to build a movement, um, or I quit. Um, <laughs> we are also building on that to build health neighborhoods in Connecticut, which is another half hour talk, but it's a way to build, bring neighborhoods in share the wealth, share the savings, so everybody gets, you. if you do the work, you get a piece of the savings. Um, and for dual eligibles right now, and eventually for the entire Medicaid um, program. Um, the state employee plan, too, which is 200,000 people in Connecticut, about five times as large as the, or four times as large as the largest private employer in Connecticut. Um, they have a, um, a patient center medical home program that now has 45,000 people in it. They call it a pilot, but I think once you have 45,000 people, <laughs> it's not a pilot anymore. Um, they're doing it with ProHealth and Hartford Medical Group and others are coming in now. They are also paying higher reimbursement rates, which on top of state employee rates, they, they start to talk some money. Um, it is, um, they plan to move toward a set fee eventually, and they're building on that to build their wellness program. So if any of you state employees have to go to the dentist twice and get your colonoscopy and your mammogram and you're probably grumbling, um, but that's why. <laughs> um, so there are exciting things happening in Connecticut. Now we're gonna hear on some ex about some exciting things happening in other states. We're gonna hear from Jennifer Bowden, who is Senior Associate Project Management from the Rhode Island Quality Initiative. Institute, rather, um, from Pittsburgh, Kyle Crawford, 
um, who is program associate for the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. We're gonna hear from Judith Steinberg from about Massachusetts's patient-centered medical home um, initiative from uh, the UMass Medical School, and then from Ken Lilim uh, from Healthy CT, the co-op, the new co-op, you should all know about this, um, and he's gonna talk about what they're doing in Connecticut around fostering patient-centered medical homes. Hi, good morning. So I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in Rhode Island to support practices that are actively transforming into medical homes. And I gotta tell you, it's really complicated. We have a lot of different initiatives going on. We have four major PCMH initiatives, all which have, you know, serve some of the same practices, have lots of the same requirements, offer some of the same services, some provide funding, some don't. So it's, it's a really big mix, it's a complicated landscape. On top of that, we have a regional extension center for health information technology that's based at the Rhode Island Quality Institute that's intended to help every primary care provider in the state adopt an electronic health record and achieve meaningful use. Um, and a number of our practices that are involved in the regional extension center are involved in these medical home initiatives as well. So it's really complicated. So I'm gonna try to boil it down a little bit and then give you uh, some of our lessons learned um, tell you what I think we shouldn't have done differently and what I don't think you should do that we did. Um, see if it makes things easier for you. So um, I'm from the Beacon Community Program at the Rhode Island Quality Institute. We are funded through a $15.9 million three-year federal grant from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. This grant was intended to help practices with health information technology interventions to support medical home transformation, as well as to build a quality reporting infrastructure for the state of Rhode Island. So to give you an example, some of the, H, the health information technology interventions we do, we have an alerting service. So when a patient who's enrolled in our health information exchange gets admitted to a hospital, goes to an ED, we can send a secure email notifying that provider immediately upon sort of whenever we get that admission, discharge, or transfer notification from that provider. We're going to be expanding that to include a pharmacy alert for things like controlled substances, as well as some alerts around telemedicine for some of our patients that are receiving telehealth services through visiting nurse agencies. We have um, also built a pretty robust quality reporting and analytics service so that we can get, um, we can receive quality uh, reporting from patients in medical homes and report at a, a provider, a site, a, um, a practice and a community level about how we're doing on quality measures, patient satisfaction, um, utilization data, all sorts of metrics, whatever we can kind of get our hands on through a variety of sources. So um, as part of the Beacon program, one of the things that we realized is we needed to do a couple years ago, or about a year ago, we actually started the funding for it. We devoted about a million dollars of this $15.9 million grant for direct practice transformation assistance. So in addition to all these other HIT interventions, regional extension center services, other things, um, we wanted to provide on-site facilitation and coaching services. We wanted to offer learning collaboratives and we contracted with TransferMed, um, which is part of the American Academy of Family Physicians to provide those on-site services. Um, we also offer sort of big learning events, learning collaboratives in collaboration with a number of community partners like the, um, the Rhode Island Chronic Care Sustainability Initiative, the CSI initiatives, the other PCMH initiatives in the state. And then we've, so we've tried to kind of build this core set of practice transformation services. And then in addition to that, we've tried to supplement them or augment them with additional things that we think can be beneficial and can help to support a learning community, a community that really thrives on learning and growing as patient-centered medical homes. So we've done things like um, sponsored nurses, about 30 nurse care managers in our community to take the guided care nursing course through Johns Hopkins. We've sponsored people to go to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's annual conferences. Um, we have um, contracted with a vendor to uh, an NCQA certified vendor to do the patient experience survey for all the practices that are participating. So um, to back up a second, the, the Beacon community uh, includes about 50 primary care sites in, in the state. They're from 28 practices. They include a mix of different, of different practice types and sizes. So they are solo practitioners. They're you know, three doc single site practices. They're larger multi-site groups. They're multi-specialty practices as well as community health centers and family-based medicines medicine residency programs. So we recognize that that's, that's a really complicated group to serve, and we're committed to making sure that we provide services to everybody within the patient-centered medical home, so it's not just about the physician, it's really about the team. 
and we want to make sure the entire team can grow. So that gets really, really, really complicated. Um, we get lots of things like, oh, that's really great, but I hate how you're doing this. <laughs> we really love this, but why can't you do more of this? And it's very difficult, to, I think, to satisfy everybody. And so lesson number one I would tell you is you're never going to satisfy everybody. I think <laughs> it's important to constantly get feedback and constantly hear what the community has to say. You know, we heard for a really long time, stop t treating us like we're just transforming into medical homes. We want more advanced content, and so we've tried to gear and adjust to that, offer more sort of robust learning opportunities and more you know, specific learning opportunities. We hear from time to time we want more networking, so we've tried to create best practice sharing meetings and networking opportunities for nurse care managers, physicians specifically. Um, but frankly, a million dollars doesn't go very far in this space. It's, it's a lot of money in a certain sense, but it's still 50 primary care practices. They're serving almost a quarter of the state's population. And so what's been critically important for us is to build a collaborative, or actually we've been building on this sort of existing collaboration of people working in the state. So we have four major PCMH initiatives. Um, lot, lot of things that are happening that are very similar to what we're doing. So it's been really important to have a dialogue and a conversation and to make sure that the work we're doing doesn't duplicate what other people are doing. Um, we got a lot of criticisms up front with the Beacon program. God, why are you doing that? You're doing exactly what they're doing, except you want it a little bit different. You want us to, to report differently. You want us to do the same thing at a different time coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. And so that's been a really big challenge. And from the outset, we would have done a much better job, I think, if we had recognized how difficult it is on the providers when they're being pulled in so many different directions. And rather than reacting to that need for coordination, to have a more proactive conversation up front. Now, I don't want to make it sound like we weren't collaborating. I think we just didn't recognize how difficult it was. And it needs to be, it's not just, uh, we're going to do this and please invite your practices to it. It really needs to be coordinated planning across sort of all the groups that are working in the space. Um, the other, one of the other big things that I would say that we did that I wouldn't recommend anybody do is we rely a lot on grant funds. We have constantly gotten grants to provide these services, and the problem with that is it doesn't build the infrastructure that you want. It doesn't allow for sustainable planning. And it means that the practices are constantly there. It's fits and starts to the practices. Oh, now you've got this consultant, and now you've got this one. They want us to do another assessment, and we just did one a year ago, and why are you making us do this all over again? So you really need dedicated funding, sustainable funding that can be drawn on and can be used to plan so that you can draw down resources as opposed to pushing things out, whatever you can push out on practices, which is kind of the way that sort of nature of the, the, the grant world. And the, the last thing I would, I would recommend is to try to get all your PCMH initiatives in the state together and create a common framework for me what medical home transformation is. So on one level, we talk about NCQA recognition as sort of the end all be all. On the other hand, it's whatever the contract tells, the health plan contract tells practices they need to do. In another case, it's what a grant tells us we need to do. And rather than constantly reacting to these different frameworks, you really need a common framework and then find the funding sources that can help to support that framework and move that forward for the state. <laughs> I know we only have eight minutes, but I was hoping we could all introduce one another. No, okay. <laughs> um, my name is Kyle Crawford. I'm from the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, um, and we have a supporting arm or supporting organization called the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative. Um, we cheat some of the funding issues that other organizations um, face because we're an operating arm of our own foundation, we're able to have these kind of long-term relationships uh, with the organizations that we work with. And so we're doing, um, we're part of the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative, which is working with a number of FQHCs to transform them into PCMHs. Um, and the, the benefit that we have is that these are organizations that we've been working with for years. Um, organizations that we've done diabetes care, um, better linkages to the community, brought in the definition of health and how they serve the communities that they're based in. Um, so we're taking that work, building upon that, um, and then working towards a PCMH with them. To step back, we, we have also a unique role in that 
Um, we're a th basically a third party nonprofit consultant to all these organizations. So we have a training arm that's trained uh, quality improvement to health professionals, over 3,000 folks uh, in the 15 years since we've been around. We take that and apply that. Um, historically, we've done what we call spot repair. Um, other folks call it islands of excellence. This idea that you can go into an emergency room, focus on process, focus on certain outcomes, uh, improve them temporarily, or hopefully sustain them, um, but they never go up one floor. They never go to another, another ward. And so what we've done is take that work and that idea that we can move from spot to spot, making these improvements, reducing readmission rates, um, et cetera, and take that skill in not only training in quality improvement, which is a central piece of PCMH, but also training some of the other important components. Um, I'm sure you've heard about all these, but we, we differentiate them into sort of three buckets. Uh, communication, which is interprofessional and interpersonal. Um, so not only between the healthcare staff, one another, but also between the healthcare staff and the patient, and then also more broadly, including communication pathways. So looking at how in transitions of care, uh, communication can be standardized and guaranteed um, or not. And then additionally, we have, uh, of course, the quality improvement piece. So that's looking at one of the biggest hurdles that we faced uh, is using data, understanding data, um, in, in this transformation process. And so a lot of folks don't under, have, have poor histories with data, it seems like a burden. They never see the eventual outcome or it being actionable data. So we've been working with uh, each of our FQHCs to better understand data, better standardize which data needs uh, collected, sorry. Um, and then that links especially to our work with uh, health IT. We're also a regional extension center uh, we work with physician practices from solo practices to huge, huge systems throughout Western Pennsylvania to achieve meaningful use. Some of the organizations that get the funding uh, through the Regional Extension Center are also a part of our PCMH program. And so we can bring our health IT experts in and give them that expertise um, along with the quality improvement training, the motivational interviewing training to work with the patients better. Um, I wanted to back up. I'm really inspired sort of by the work that's been going on in uh, nursing schools and some of the other schools. We've been looking at this a lot, and I think there's this issue of do you work predominantly with current frontline workers? Do you work with the education system to make sure incoming workers uh, have the skills that they need? These sort of softer skills, a team-based skill, um, those sorts of things. We, in response to the lack of that, for lack of a better word, uh, we've been running fellowship programs that are multidisciplinary for graduate students in uh, a variety of health programs for over the last 10 years. And it gives them, one is based on leadership, but the other is based on quality improvement and patient safety. And taking these folks who are in graduate programs that never interact with one another, bringing them together monthly, or in the case of one of them, every week, um, to go into a clinic that our organization's currently working with and it involve them, train them to use quality improvement skills, but then uh, allow them to go into the medical facility and apply those skills and then present those findings to the organization as part of either the broader PCMH efforts or um, just general quality improvement work that we do with each of the organizations. Um, one other piece that I wanted to mention is that we have this training piece about the enhanced skill set that each of the organizations uh, is hoping to achieve. But we also have this sort of other piece, which is just somebody who's dedicated to knowing the PCMH model, knowing the components that are necessary, that gives the um, each of the clinics the ability to go to somebody who understands the application process, who understands the steps and the outcomes that are necessary. And I think that's important to have coaches that are there regularly, but then also have somebody that you can go to for particular more administrative um, means. Are we supposed to? I don't know if we're supposed to answer the magic wand yet, yes. but I want to. Um, be, because there's all this, we have a great physician on staff who says, um, like somebody else said, health, health happens in between visits. Uh, we can only do so much in an actual clinic. My thought is that um, we need to, of course, brought in the definition of health or in how we think about medical services to think better about how that links to health, but specifically how when we are talking about integrating uh, EHRs between pharmacies and 
uh, physicians and OTs, how we can also make those things either actually linked or better utilized um, in conjunction with social services. So if you have somebody who's coming to you for depression because they've been unemployed for a year, it, you should be able to instantly just refer somebody to an employment agency or a training organization. It should be a prescription just like anything else. Um, I think that peace has been lacking. I think both, both systems refer within their own network. So social services refer to social services, medical facilities refer to medical facilities. And I think if we're talking about broadening um, health definitions and the idea and the framework of community health, I think it has to link these two pieces. So thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present about the Massachusetts uh, initiative on the patient-centered medical home. Uh, so what I'll do is provide a, um, an overview, a brief overview of this statewide initiative, and then really focus in on the technical assistance that we're providing to practices that are participating in this initiative as they embark on primary care transformation. And then I'll finish up with some lessons learned. All right. So the Mass Patient-Centered Medical Home Initiative is a statewide, multi-payer demonstration of the patient-centered medical home. It's sponsored by our, our state's Health and Human Services Agency and is being, being implemented in partnership with UMass Medical School and Baylet Health Purchasing, which is a private healthcare consulting company. And I'm here because I'm leading the team at UMass Medical School that's uh, providing much of the technical assistance to the practices. So there are 46 practices that are participating in this uh, statewide initiative, and they are diverse in many different ways. They're diverse geographically, they span across the state, diverse in terms of practice setting, practice size, they have some residency programs, there's onesie, twosie private practices, and 52% of the practices are community health centers. And that's because um, our multi-payer initiative has a public payer predominance. It was very difficult for us to get all the uh, commercial payers on board at that time in the healthcare reform history uh, of Massachusetts. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, those are, the, those are the practices. Um, there, are, there is some payment reform that comes with this demonstration. In addition to fee-for-service, we have two prospective payments for, that cover uh, patient-centered medical home components. One is specifically for clinical care management of the highest risk patients, the most complex patients in the practice. And then there's another uh, payment stream for shared savings. Practices who uh, meet a quality benchmark can share in the savings if there are savings. All right. In our model, uh, we are looking to implement all the components of the patient-centered medical home, but in particular, we're focusing on this clinical care management of the highest risk patients, because we think that's a critical component uh, to the success of the, of the medical home. And also, because of our patient population, we are focusing in on the integration of behavioral health and primary care. So this demonstration is uh, a three-year demonstration. We're halfway through it. And it's really providing the foundation for more scaled up efforts around uh, uh, practice redesign and care delivery uh, uh, reform in Massachusetts. And that's very exciting to see the next steps that are in process right now. So now let's focus on the uh, technical assistance that we're providing to practices. And they, uh, there are four elements to that uh, technical assistance. First, uh, we developed a transformation roadmap. We've provided learning collaboratives, uh, basically have set up a learning collaborative for the participating practices. We've developed a, a service of medical home facilitators, and uh, we're providing support for practices to develop their QI, the quality improvement infrastructure. So we'll take that one at a time. So uh, the first step was to develop a roadmap for transformation, and we did that with the leadership of our quality improvement and transformation director, who has uh, national experience with other medical home demonstrations, which she brought that experience to Massachusetts for us, which was great. Uh, and then she's worked with the, um, the faculty at UMass Medical School and the on-the-ground medical home facilitators, uh, as, as well as uh, some consumer representatives. I, I think we could do a better job with having more consumer representation 
transportation in our transformation plan. Uh, but to put together this transformation roadmap, which is um, uh, basically providing the framework for the training and technical assistance that we provide, and also um, is continually being re <laughs> uh, evolving, basically. One of the major lessons learned uh, that we've had is that the stepwise progression to the patient-centered medical home is not a linear process. <laughs> All right, so the, the second uh, tech aspect of technical assistance is the development, uh, is really the provision of a learning collaborative. And so we've uh, set up learning sessions for our practices. We've held six learning sessions to date. Uh, one of them was uh, solely focused on behavioral health integration in primary care. And between these learning sessions, we hold, we share, we continue the sharing of, of learning um, by holding monthly conference calls with our practice teams and also with the clinical care managers because that's such a new and, as I said, critical element to the patient centered medical home. And then we also uh, use, we've developed a patient centered medical home initiative website, which is our main form of communication and ongoing sharing because we post the webinars, the presentations. Um, practice tools such as uh, great examples of protocols for standing orders or uh, job descriptions for the clinical care manager. We've also developed uh, toolkits for patient and family engagement and also we're in the process of, de of developing a five-part uh, toolkit for behavioral health integration. All of that's uh, accessed through the website. And then we've also uh, developed some online courses um, which are also accessed through the website. And that was really done with an eye towards spread in the practices. So not everybody can attend the learning collaborative sessions, not everybody can attend those conference calls in the practice. So this gives an opportunity for other practice members to learn about the patient-centered medical home processes, spread this through the practice. And also it was done with an eye towards uh, the future so that we have some uh, courses already developed as we scale up this model across the state. So the next element is the medical home facilitation. So we developed a service of medical home facilitators. Uh, these are individuals who have a clinical background as well as a uh, skill set in quality improvement and organizational change management not an easy skill set to put together in one, in, in one individual. Uh, so we have done some training uh, to help support our medical home facilitators in their, in their role. And what the medical home facilitators do is that they, they help the practice, they work with the practices with a staffing ratio of one medical home facilitator to 10 to 12 practices, which is pretty standard across the country. Uh, and they help the practices take what they've learned uh, in the learning collaborative sessions on these conference calls and then help make that happen, make it happen for them in the practices uh, with their patient population, their staff, their culture. Right. So we think this is a very critical element to the uh, transformation support. It's expensive, um, but there is uh, good data, and I think Jeff showed uh, some of that data, that there is a, a return on investment for the medical home facilitation, especially if it's well, um, well deployed, the, this, the time uh, is well deployed. A um, fourth element is the quality improvement, uh, supporting practices in their quality improvement infrastructure. So we uh, delineated some uh, performance measures, clinical performance measures, that the practices are reporting on on a monthly basis. And what we do is uh, help, uh, and they, they do that through the website. And um, we help, we take that data and aggregate it and trend it and report it back uh, to the practices and help them use that for their quality improvement on site in the practices. We think that's the uh, found, that, that quality improvement infrastructure is a foundational element to uh, being able to make the change in, your, in a practice. We also uh, are providing payer data on utilization of uh, emergency rooms and, uh, hos and, and ho hospitalizations. That's been more challenging, hard, you know, with a multi-payer uh, demonstration, trying to get all the payers on board and having one, uh, an accessible, usable type of report is not so easy. So some lessons learned. There have been, been many, uh, <laughs> as, as, as we have heard. I think one of the major lessons learned is that engaged leadership is a critical piece to the success of any kind of change initiative. We've seen that at, our, at the policy and uh, political level with our Secretary of Health and Human Services, who has set a vision for primary care transformation in our, in our state and has, is hell-bent on moving forward and making that happen. 
Similarly, in the practices, you need to have in, uh, the, uh, the leadership engage, setting that vision, and providing the resources for change. And it's really those practices that have that kind of leadership that are really making progress. We've also learned similarly that, that it's important to align, or there's a lot of health reform initiatives happening, especially in Massachusetts, and, uh, and so it's really important to align those initiatives because these initiatives are coming at the practices in all different directions. Thirdly, we, um, the, the diversity that we uh, intentionally chose in our practice uh, our population does lead to some challenges in terms of uh, being able to customize our transformation support to the individual needs of these practices. Fourthly, I mentioned about the, uh, the uh, uh, clinical care management which is a, uh, a key component, but very difficult and challenging component to implement in the, in the practice. And lastly, we've learned, just as, as uh, patient-centered medical home demonstrations have learned across the country, that change is hard. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. The, the, the advantage of going last and maybe the disadvantage is those are wonderful programs. <laughs> um, that, that is a bit further ahead than, than Connecticut seems to be in many aspects. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of history, um, both uh, from an IPA point of view, we're a statewide uh, physician organization, and on to a new initiative uh, of a co-op, uh, a, a funded new payer, a not-for-profit payer in the state of Connecticut. Um, so a little bit of history, then the lessons learned, and we'll go through a similar process. Um, and I'm going to answer the first one on the front end. I in Connecticut, the magic bullet, in my opinion, is standardization and multi-payer slash purchaser initiatives. Oh. Um, I'll go to 2010. We won't go all the way back to 1986. But uh, um, anybody will drown that. It was MD Health Plan that was founded in 1986 with the IPA, and that's the, the, the roots. Um, we ended up with a health net contract along the way. Realize that when HealthNet left the marketplace, the IPA, being a 7,000 physician organization, really needed to transform. That wasn't going to be anything the payers in the state of Connecticut needed. They had a 7,000 physician network. So we transformed along the lines of what we called a patient-centered practice model, uh, because as we went out into the community to talk about this medical home concept, before we got a chance to even talk about clinical care and standards or anything else, the word home just stuck in, out there and it's turned it into, you know, is this gonna be home visits? Do I have to start doing home visits? And, and do, I, do I, then I'm managing at the nursing home? It all evolved to a funeral home and we were in trouble. <laughs> so we, we turned it into a practice model saying that the patient was actually going to engage with the practice because they're not always gonna see the physician. They are going to see multidisciplinary team so we wanted to try to get that concept out there. So we developed a network underneath our 7,000 physician network. It's up to about 1,800 practitioners now. Um, multi about half primary care, half specialty, because we are looking towards neighborhoods and anything else we want to call those delivery models. So as we did that, we realized that you had to provide some funding. So we went out and got some contracts with, in the Medicare Advantage space um, and provided funding. Uh, it was not too many payers, just a few payers, uh, and the IPA was providing the funding for those practices. It was all intended to move as many of those practices as we could to a NCQA recognized patient-centered medical home. So there was a, we put the process in place. We first started with technology, then we started with communication, and then we worked towards providing the services to get you to a patient-centered medical home. The first one that we embarked on uh, actually was through the State Medical Society, who's our shareholder, uh, and Qualidime, who I think you'll hear from maybe somebody before the end of the day, uh, to actually go out. We got a grant from the Physicians Foundation, and we're able to put 20 practices, about 100 physicians, um, through a training program that 19 of those rec were recognized at level three. Um, so that was wonderful. There weren't that many initiatives going on in the state of Connecticut. There were some practices, ProHealth and the Community Health Center, that were moving forward with their own initiative, but this was voluntary. We actually recruited practices to do this. This was not one PC. A little bit easier when you have the command and control. IPAs are a little bit more difficult to get those things across. Um, so that was the first initiative. That was uh, 2011. During the year of 2011, uh, Dr. Dalal mentioned that there was this thing called the ACA that was out there, you know, changing the world a little bit. There were six pages out of that 2200 that we read and found that you could actually get a rather large sum of money from the federal government to build a new 
not-for-profit health plan in your state, every state. They originally put aside 7.3 billion. Um, it got cut down to 3.8 billion, still a pretty big number. Um, so we embarked on applying for that delivery model. Um, we applied for that last October 17th, and so that gets us up to last fall. Um, so that application went in, and it sat there. It's with CMS. It's getting cooked around. We realized we got to continue this patient, excuse me, this patient-centered medical home initiative. The co-op, which is called Healthy CT, did have a name, um, was actually founded. The core, one of the core quality initiatives is to advance patient-centered medical home as one of the building blocks. It is by no means the only answer. It is one of the building blocks to transform the, the, the uh, medical delivery system. So the IPA sponsored another round of, of practices in early um, uh, 2012. That group, I think I just heard today, well, that was, uh, um, actually we ended up with a grant somewhere in the middle of all that from the Universal Healthcare Foundation to change our standards from 2008 to 11, dramatic change. A lot of information has to be moved into the different manuals that were out there, the, the uh, um, webinar series that was put on by Qualidime, who's the uh, consulting group that does the work for us. Um, so that was put in place. We started the next cohort. The first practice, am I correct, the, Michelle, the first practice uh, that we've gotten approved, level three, under 2011 standards. I don't know how many people have gone through that and looked at those standards. They are onerous, and somebody actually made it through. That's fabulous. So we have a bunch of practices still to come in that cohort. Um, in June, the co-op got funded. We got a $76 million loan from the federal government. They're now our bank. That's very interesting and a lot of, a lot of oversight, taxpayer money. Uh, but one of the portions of the loan agreement that we had with CMS is to fund medical homes. So we have in that contract 75 practices that we will go forward with over the next year. We're doing it 25 practices at a clip. Um, one is starting this week. Next one starts uh, November, December-ish, next one in February. So before the end of a year, we will have another 75 practices brought forward. Each one of those practices, ballpark is four to five physicians in the state of Connecticut. We still have an awful lot of small practices in the state. Um, so between all the initiatives that we're looking at, the ones we did through the first grant, the second one the IPA funded, and the third one now that the co-op is really embracing and really bringing forward, we will have moved about 500 four to 500 physicians into this new model. If you combine that with what was there before and what's going on with DSS, which is a fabulous program, we come close to what Rhode Island has now. Correct, about 50% of your primary cares are in a, in a medical home. So Connecticut has a bit of a way to go. Um, but I think that the way that it is being developed and at least in this case, a payer coming forward and saying that they're willing to put those dollars up front because the return is long-term. Uh, a not-for-profit payer has a bit of a different look um, than a for-profit payer. There's a shareholder difference, I think, somewhere in there. Um, so that return isn't needed. It can be put back into quality, can be put back into premiums, um, et cetera. So that's, that's a huge advantage. On to lessons learned and what um, we think is a critical component, it was actually stated in your last part, a an active participation in physician leadership. That is engagement, education, and one critical piece is that they have to have the control to make the decisions in their practices. If they are not the, the, the managing partner, they are not engaged in that decision that they can't dictate your salary and anything else that's in that process. So in Connecticut, we have an older primary care block of physicians that is very difficult because many of them do not want to take on this challenge and they're making those decisions. So even though we have good things going on in medical schools and everything else, new guys coming out aren't necessarily finding uh, as a receptive process. So we are trying to provide that education to show physicians that there are payers coming forward and you will be able to do this so that they can, they can transform and bring the rest of the physician population with them. So in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the payer involved here is really making a concerted effort to help bring the community forward because it's going to help everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. There's, um, I'm taking lots of notes. Um, but I got to ask my, my magic wand question. Um, I usually have to say after that that you can't have money. Um, but none of them said money. So you're very well disciplined. Thank you. Um, so are there questions? Uh, there have to be questions. 
Uh-huh. Um, in the um, Healthy Connecticut plan that you talked about, um, you mentioned the involvement of physicians, and I'm wondering, Fairly, it's a new plan. This is a you know just got funded. We rented space the other day. You know that that kind of level of development. Um, so we're putting together all our clinical committees and all the rest. It, it's practitioner. It, you know it's not. You know we talk physician. We we went out. We're building our network. The network is going to be built of physicians and all other disciplines uh, in the medical delivery field. So as the model in each in the practices evolves, <coughs> payers have to go with that evolution and we will be embracing all of that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also regarding the Healthy Connecticut group there. You said what kind of physicians are involved in this and are pediatricians included in your group? In the PCMH development effort? <coughs> yes, absolutely. We have, I would say, a third of the practices that are coming forward are pediatric. I, I have a question. You said um, you have a lot of specialists. Are they interested in becoming medical homes? And how does that work? How are they going to, how does that, oh, he's smiling. This is good. Yeah, we have had the question. Uh -huh. um, we do ask that um, they let us know if two thirds of their delivery without checking um, <laughs> CPT codes and all the rest of the things that other entities have. If you say to us you're a primary care physician providing the full spectrum of primary care services, mm -hmm. not just those that you want to, then you can be part of this initiative. Cool, great. Um, okay, they're all over here. You guys have to come up with some questions. Um, way in the back, sure. Right here. Yep. Uh, Judith, I had a question in regards to the integrated behavioral health services that are being known in Massachusetts. Is that um, a behavioral clinician embedded in the practice? The question is about uh, integration of behavioral health and primary care and whether that means uh, having a behavioral health specialist uh, in the practice. Uh, that would be an ideal. Uh, what, we are, what we have done is to uh, identify what we think are important elements of integration. But because of the diversity of the practices and the different practice settings, et cetera, um, we're, we recognize that there may be different approaches to uh, behavioral health integration such as, that's along the spectrum. So that, that spectrum begins with having uh, coordinated but non-co-located primary care and behavioral health. And then the next might be co-located uh, co and coordinated and, the, and fully into the spectrum is, is a fully integrated uh, co-located behavioral health where that behavioral health specialist works side by side with the primary care clinicians. So uh, small, pra uh, small private practices may not be able to uh, get to that, that um, the, the full level of that spectrum, uh, but but uh, importantly, these integration elements of that uh, pertain to um, communication between primary care and behavioral health, that pertain to implementing a behavioral health focus in primary care, including screening for behavioral health and doing uh, and providing um, support for behavior change uh, in for, for patients having a um, clinic system integration between primary care and behavioral health and care coordination, care management. These are the elements that we are looking to, to implement, but with d these different approaches. Okay, um, sure. Just in relation to that, and what are the other three states are including behavioral health as a major component? We have within, <laughs> I can talk loudly anyway. Um, we have within the Beacon community, so in this is common for some of the other PCMH initiatives, there are some depression screening measures. And then one of the um, patient center medical home initiatives has focused on the integration of behavioral health. And it's focused more on behavioral medicine, so teaching wellness. Mm -hmm working with people to stop smoking, weight loss, all those things as opposed to behavioral health care. But a number of our practices have also um, worked to integrate behavioral health in. Now, I would argue it's not true integration in most instances, that it's really co-located care or coordinated care. I don't think we've really quite gotten to the point of, of true integrated care in our state. Yeah, we're working on that too. Um, 
The focus is particularly on screenings for depression and substance use, um, but then also linking that, yeah, to a be behavioral specialist who can um, provide the motivational interviewing skills and whatever else to affect that behavior change. Uh, I think Connecticut is woefully behind in the integration of that process. Um, and it, it isn't going to be one initiative to make that change. Uh, some of the things from analytics that we're looking at is physicians that, primary care physicians prescribing antidepressants yet not actually coding for antidepression, for, for depression. And, and it creates a real problem when you have all payer databases and, and without the diagnostic information to understand what the population is that should be that denominator, it's a smaller population that's identified. Some of that has to do with the, the age of our primary care physicians, um, not that long ago in their minds, if they actually put down a diagnosis of depression, they got paid a 90801 instead of a 99213. So they got paid as a psychiatrist. And there was a, you know, they, they, they didn't get, if they got audited, it was a problem, but um, they got paid less. And so they were like, well, I'll just not put down this diagnosis and I'll bill my 99213 or four or whatever they're doing. So it became a financial issue and they got into a pattern. They still haven't gotten out of that pattern. So we identify it for them. If you're ordering an antidepressant and you don't have that diagnosis on there, please check your records, please go back. We're not the only one that's gonna be looking. So we've gotta change this at a systemic prop area before we start integrating. And, but we are behind in Connecticut, behind any of the initiatives that I heard today. I've been lectured by communications people. We're not supposed to say that anymore. Oh, sorry. There's room for improvement. <laughs> There's plenty of room for improvement. See? How well he's trained. <laughs> um, there was another, yes. Yeah. Hi, I, I, my question lies right under that diagnosis of depression. Um, we find that a lot of the issues that are presenting in the medical setting are not medical. Um, at least the root causes are not medical, but they are social and psychosocial. Um, and many clinicians are really uncomfortable um, treading on that turf. Uh, but if you're a PCM nation, you're going to have to like, look at that stuff. So if, if somebody's coming to you, whatever, your, whatever the issue is, the, the root causes are often, you know, things like, like isolation and loneliness and rape and violence and hunger and unemployment and it's that kind of stuff that clinicians aren't comfortable with. How do you provide evolving PCMHs with the assistance to be able to address those issues? So that's what I was getting at in terms of having a behavioral health focus in primary care. And it does, it's going to take some training. Uh, some of it I, we think will happen as the um, primary care and behavioral health providers are working more uh, in, in a more coordinated and collaborative fashion. So they'll learn from each other. Uh, and one of the integration elements that we talk about is the sharing of expertise and doing provider to provider consultations, doing case reviews. So they're gonna learn as they do, as they, uh, care for patients together. And then there's some focused training on motivational interviewing and also understanding the roles of the, uh, of the entire primary care team that would include primary care clinicians as well as behavioral health providers. So it's a combination of, of, of approaches. I think within our community, one of the key ways that I think the behavioral health needs as well as sort of the broader so psychosocial needs of the population get addressed are through the nurse care managers. And I think it's less than ideal though. Um, so the nurse care managers often develop very trusting relationships with the patients, but they can only serve a small subset of the patient population. Um, the nice thing about that is they can then, I think, relieve some of the, the providers to spend their time focused on sort of the things that they're experts at. And so instead of, you know, when you have these sort of patients who are coming in, Constantly, they're high utilizers of care. They have very extensive needs. The nurse care managers have a little bit more, or a lot more flexibility to spend more time with the patients, to work with the family, to work at, at a broader level, to do home visits where it's needed. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's that ideal. They're a very expensive workforce, and I think there are probably a lot of other ways that can be done. Um, one approach that some of us have talked about in Rhode Island is to have, a is to have community health teams available. 
Um, and so they're sort of extensions of the primary care practices. In some cases, they could be co-located with the primary care practices. In other cases, they're centralized. And they can provide a broad set of social services um, beyond just sort of what the, the medical providers can, can offer and the, and the medical team can offer. Um, and I would like, when we do that, to have things like, um, you know, being able to write a prescription for food to address food insecurity, to be able to write a prescription or for to offer a, a more direct mechanism for the medical community to start addressing some of those broader needs of the patients. I hate it when stuff like that comes up at the end because I want to know more about that. <laughs> but we're going to talk. I'm sitting with you at lunch. Um, one, one quick piece of that, that, that is part of the plan that we'll be rolling out over the next couple of years is a health literacy component to that. We feel that with on both sides of the equation, this isn't literacy only on the patient side, this is also on the provider side, um, that there's, there's a, a lot of misconception there. Uh, patients don't really know how to approach the clinicians, no matter what model we put in place. So we need to, to break down some of those barriers through education uh, so that that communication can happen and then the appropriate model can be, can be addressed. So those are long term. You know, we didn't get to this problem that we're trying to address here. We got here in what, a couple of generations of time? You know, something from the 60s that generated this beginning of this. We're not gonna get there in a quarter. Uh, it's not a financial issue in a quarter. It, it's gonna take a generation to change to, to get back on track. Great, I, um, two minutes, okay. Somebody can ask a two minute question and you're How are the physician practices that you're speaking about affiliated with the hospitals mm -hmm. in your state compared to our state? Well, uh, it, it varies by the practice. Some are actually on the license of the hospital. Right? Some of the community health centers are, are on the license of the larger academic medical centers. Some are just affiliated. So, and uh, so it, it, is a, it, it varies. But where are you going with this question? <laughs> yes, compared to Connecticut, I know a lot of our physician practices are very affiliated with the hospitals compared to being more privately run. But only in the last couple of years. Yeah. Right. I would say we're, we're behind in that as well. Right. I don't know and if that's an opportunity, but. I think that's actually a, a, a gap in the model. And uh, in order for this model to, to work fully, it's, it needs to recognize the fact that it's primary care, yes, is the foundation, it should be the foundation of healthcare delivery, but it's only, it is a piece of it. And we need to uh, engage the, the hospitals and the specialists and the community services uh, in, a, in, a, in a medical neighborhood, as we've been talking about, and make sure that the incentives are aligned because right now the hospitals, uh, for the most part, are incentivized to fill their beds. And the patient-centered medical home, the primary care practices, are incentivized to reduce their <laughs> the filling of their beds. <laughs> so we need to get this together. And, and that is, uh, I think, where the accountable care organizations, if it's done right, with patient-centered medical homes and the foundation, might be helpful. Ours isn't particularly PCMH related, but one of the things we did when, with working with a hospital was um, Patients in Southwest with Pennsylvania uh, with HIV have one of the highest hospital 30-day re readmission rates. And so what we did, um, it's actually one of our primary um, HIV clinics is affiliated with the hospital but located a couple blocks away. Um, the hospital was not communicating anything to that clinic when a patient with HIV was being discharged. What we did was just basically enhance the communication linkage between the two, um, and we saw a 52% uh, reduction in readmission rates. Um, so there is a role. I don't think it particularly pertains to PCMH only. It's just the way that any of our ser services communicate with any of the other services um, that individuals are using. Well, thank you all very much. Um, Jill's going to tell us about lunch. <laughs> I would like to take just 10 seconds to thank and recognize Jill Zorn, our senior program officer, who almost single-handedly designed the program for today. And, and um, the staff team uh, who helped with the logistics led by Mishi Knight. And also so, University of and, and the University of Hartford, our grantee here at the University of Hartford, who now is Deputy Commissioner of Public Health, uh, Kathy Krantz-Lewis. Thank you.